everybody. This is attorney Arkady Freckman, a New York City personal injury trial attorney. And today we're talking about shoulder injuries. And we're talking about it from the beginning, intake, all the way to trial, and especially value. How much is a shoulder injury worth? What is the case value? How much can you, as a serious injury victim, receive either in a settlement or in a verdict? And specifically today, I'm actually going to be analyzing four different cases. And it's from a New York injury cases blog that I subscribe to. And so I receive the blog and it's a written blog by another attorney named John Hockfelder. And a big shout out to Mr. Hockfelder. I think he does a great job. He really researches these cases. He analyzes them. And then he talks about the facts, the injuries, and he tells you what happens at trial. And then he includes illustrations and he talks about what will happen after the trial. Because after a trial verdict, there can be an appeal. And then that final appeal decision is the actual disposition or resolution of the case. So let's talk about uh, the most recent blog he sent to me on June 2nd of this year of 2022. And the first case he talks about is a lady named Henry, Henry versus New Jersey Transit Corp. So what happened to Miss Henry is she was standing on a bus and the bus rear-ended another vehicle. And as she's standing on the bus, she's a strap hanger, right? She's holding on, it, uh, she, she's caused a fall because of that uh, crash and she injures her shoulder. Uh, she's thrown to the floor. And so the issue on, in this case was not liability. Summary judgment was decided for Miss Henry because she was thrown to the floor and the bus rear-ended another vehicle. So it's the bus's fault. The jury allowed for pain and suffering damages in the amount of $800,000. And the way they broke that down was they said 400,000 for the past, meaning the date of the incident when she fell on the bus up until the date of the trial. It took four years to get to trial. And she got $400,000 for that past pain and suffering, which is always the date of your injury up until the date of the trial. And for the future, she received another 400,000. And the future is the date of the trial up until the rest of her life as calculated by the pattern jury instructions, which have life expectancy tables. Those are just averages. So she was expected to live 21 more years. So what happened was uh, the trial judge thought that the uh, jury verdict was reasonable and the appellate court agreed. Uh, the plaintiff, Ms. Henry, what, what she suffered was a three-part proximal humerus fracture dislocation requiring an emergency open reduction and internal fixation, which is the insertion of plates and screws. And then she needed a second surgery, which was arthroscopic, but that one was 10 months later for a subacromial decompression and a debridement of the glenohumeral joint and rotator cuff. So she went, she had one year of physical therapy, she had a significant scar, and she had con uh, claimed continuing and permanent pain. So, um, you know, like in many cases, the defendants, they argued that the jury verdict was excessive. It's against the weight of the evidence, that the evidence did not support such an amount. And that's why they did the appeal. And, you know, they claimed she had a good recovery, everything is better, everything went away, and that her disabilities were minor. But, you know, this is not minor. Open reduction internal fixation is a major surgery. Arthroscopic surgery is a major surgery. So, you know, if you want to ask my opinion, I think 800000 is actually low. I think she should have gotten more. But, you know, uh, definitely is not uh, too much. And that's what the appell appellate division uh, held. So she kept the 800000 Now, the second case was a 46-year-old man who was in a car crash. And the first case, by the way, happened in Manhattan. So it was the first department appellate division and it happened in Manhattan, which is New York County. It's kind of like that, that show Law and Order where you hear the music at the beginning and they show that courthouse, that's 60 Center Street, 80 Center Street. That's where uh, this, this case happened. Now the second case happened in the fourth department and the second case was actually against the state of New York. So what happened was a gentleman was involved in a motor vehicle crash and he sustained shoulder injuries 
and he had to go to the court of claims because it was against the police. There was a trooper and the trooper um, was responding to an emergency and uh, liability against the state could only be found if his conduct was reckless. Because, you know, if you're responding to an emergency and you're a police officer, like a trooper, you're expected to, you have the power, they give you that extra power, right? With great power comes great responsibility. So they give you that extra power that you can run red lights, but you still have to be careful. You can't be reckless, right? You can't close your eyes and, and, and kill people. So they found that this guy was reckless. And after hearing the testimony from both drivers, the judge issued a decision holding that the trooper demonstrated reckless disregard for the safety of others based upon continued rate of high speed as he approached an intersection on wet pavement and dense fog and he never stopped. And so, yeah, so that, that was the liability. But this, again, because it's the court of claims and now there's no jury, this is all decided by a judge. So one individual, I don't know if it was a male judge, female judge, but this one individual now has all the power, right? They decide everything in this case. And so what happened was the judge allowed for $550,000, but he found that the trooper, the state of New York, was 75% at fault, whereas the claimant, the person suing, because he was also a driver, he might have also done some, you know, not so careful things as in the rules of the road. He found um, the, the plaintiff was 25% at fault. So then the $550,000, that was for a torn labrum in the shoulder, causing pain, arthroscopic surgery, post-traumatic arthritis with, of the AC joint with the development of ganglion cysts. So the injury was to the um, labrum. And that is, I think Mr. Uh, Hockfelder in his blog, he actually encloses like a little um, shoulder anatomy um, demonstrative and he shows the labrum is the rim of cartilage to which the capsule attaches. Yeah, I, I always looked at it that way as well. There's labrums and it's like the lip, the little edging is the, the labrum. And that's where he, he attaches a demonstrative. Maybe I'll drop the demonstrative in the video so you could take a look as well. So the way it broke down was it was 25% reduction for the plaintiff's own share of fault, right? Because you can't recover for your percentage of fault. So it gets reduced and then you could only recover for the percentage of fault that is the defendants, the one you're suing. And the total amount was 550,000. It was 300,000 for the past, and that was 10 years. And it was 250,000 for the future, which was 23 years. Now, the third case was a 47-year-old man in a trip and fall accident with rotator cuff and labral tears. And it's a case in the second department, which includes uh, Brooklyn, Queens, Westchester. This was a man who tripped and fell in a subway station and he fell because those tiles were cracked on the platform where you wait for the train. And so a jury in Manhattan, again, this is Manhattan, uh, found that the transit authority was fully at fault and then they allowed for 600,000 in uh, pain and suffering, 300,000 for the past, six and a half years and 300,000 for the future, 25 years. And the defendant appealed arguing that the amount was excessive and the appellate court affirmed, meaning they agreed with the jury's verdict and they kept it, they didn't change it. Um, so yeah, so this was a subway station in Manhattan uh, and plaintiff sustained a right shoulder rotator cuff and labral tear. So that lip that we talked about was torn where the capsule inserts as, as well as the rotator cuff was torn and there was impingement and that required arthroscopic surgery to fix the rotator cuff. And uh, the surgery was also with anchor, with anchors and they had to put anchors in. So that's more serious because those are like metal anchors that they put in to hold the shoulder together because it can't be held together otherwise. So that's much more serious than a regular arthroscopic surgery. And the defense noted that the plaintiff didn't seek medical attention until six weeks, but the plaintiff countered that um, he just, he tried to call an orthopedist and make an appointment, but the next appointment was six weeks away, so it wasn't his fault. And so they go back and forth. But the way that these appellate courts, right, because once the jury gives the decision, the jury is essentially saying, look, we think this case is worth 600,000. Now the defendants say, oh my God, 600,000, that's so much, let's appeal. 
But what is the legal standard that the appellate division, the appeals judges, look at to decide, you know, do I keep the jury's verdict or do I overturn the jury's verdict, right? Affirm means we let it stand, we affirm it, it's good. And reverse means we flip it around and we say, no, do the trial again or let's lower it because the jury is just um, wrong. And the standard is whether the verdict is supported by legally sufficient evidence, right? There has to be evidence like testimony, medical records, doctor's opinions that supports the jury's verdict. Because what if somebody's just really persuasive, goes into court and the jury says, you know, we like this guy, we're just gonna give him a hundred million dollars. Well, you can't do that, right? You have to have legally sufficient evidence. And number two, the jury verdict cannot be against the weight of the evidence. And the weight of the evidence refers to just the, the, the amount of evidence, the weight, that there's a lot of it, right? The greater weight, which, which side has the greater weight of evidence, but also whether it's believable, whether it's credible, the weight, right? You could have a lot of evidence, but it's all baloney evidence, and that's all bad. You could have a little evidence, but it's really believable because maybe it's from an independent witness or it's just so strong. So that, that's what they look at, those two factors. Now, the final case was 225,000 for a 51-year-old man and a scaffold fall. Now, a scaffold fall in New York falls under the labor law, which is a construction site accident, and it's gravity related because the worker falls from a scaffold, and that's protected by a section 240, meaning that the worker's own fault or negligence doesn't really come into play. If the worker falls from a height and it's gravity related while they're doing work, uh, it's absolute liability against the owner of the job site, the landlord, as well as the general contractor. So in New York, the law really protects the construction worker. So in this case, it was a man named uh, Chun Jo, and he was in the course of his employment. He was actually removing asbestos, and he fell six feet from a scaffold at a state office building in Albany. So this is the third department. This is upstate near Albany, the capital of New York. And what happened was, again, he had to sue the state of New York because it was the, the Capitol building. And so because of that, he couldn't get a jury. He had to go in front of a judge. And this judge, Court of Claims judge, allowed for pain and suffering damages in the total amount of 225,000, all passed from the date of the incident up until the date of the trial, six years and eight months, nothing for the future. And Mr. Joe was 51 years old at the time of his fall. And he appealed because he said, you know what? Why am I getting so little? Look at all my injuries. I have a discectomy with a fusion to my neck at C5, C6 and C6, C7. I have lumbar L3 through L5, which is L3, L4, L5. That's three discs. I have I need a lumbar decompressive surgery, a laminectomy and a discectomy to my lower back, in addition to my neck. And the final thing is I have a right shoulder impingement with a labral tear, which required arthroscopic surgery. And by the way, just like as though, as though those three things are not enough, I have a fourth. I have a wrist scaphoid, non-union and contracture adhesions requiring open reduction internal fixation to co correct that. But you know, the judge just didn't buy it. The judge just said, look, the only thing I'm gonna give you compensation for is the shoulder. Everything else is pre-existing. And um, it's just, uh, he said, it's grossly exaggerated. It's not credibly asserted and patently unsupported by the trial evidence, right? So it's like the opposite of the third case we discovered, we, we just talked about. He's saying here that it's all the, the shoulder, sure, the shoulder, you have the injury, you had arthroscopic surgery, I agree, you have this impingement, this labral tear, so I'm gonna allow for 225,000. Everything else is pre-existing, nothing to do with this fall, and I'm giving you zero. So, you know, judges tend to be more conservative than juries, so maybe if this Mr. Joe just, you know, fell at a private um, house, a private construction uh, skyscraper, let's say in Manhattan, he would have been able to sue and get a jury and maybe he would have gotten a million dollars, right? But because it was a judge or, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know the details of the case. I obviously, I didn't review the whole trial transcript, but it sounds like um, this, this gentleman uh, did have some pre-existing injuries that were unrelated. And so uh, he received that, that compensation. But I think this is really interesting for shoulder injuries because, 
it really shows you how shoulder injuries get valued. First of all, you know, you could settle the case with the defendants if you agree on an amount. And that's like a contract. You just get that money that you agree to. Like we just had another video where we settled the case for, I believe, 600000 So we just get that money. We settled another one for a million. Here, all these cases were jury verdicts, right? Either by a jury or by a judge, but they were after trials. So in a judge trial, the judge decides the amount. In a jury trial, the jury decides on the amount. All six jurors have to agree. And then even after you get that jury verdict, which is like you saw the, the numbers, right? Sometimes four years, sometimes six years after the date of incident. It takes so long to get to a jury. But now you have the jury verdict. And yet still, you can't get the money. They're going to appeal. Either the defendant can appeal and say, you know, it's too much. It's excessive. Or like in Mr. Joe's case, the plaintiff can appeal. He could say, you know what? I, I don't like it. How come I have all these injuries? Like, you know, four surgeries, open reductions, non-unions, my neck, my lower back, my, my shoulder. And you're only giving me 225000 So either side can appeal. And then finally, the appellate division will make a decision. But in all these cases, it seems like the appellate division just affirmed the jury. And usually, like, you know, from my experience, for the most part, that's what they do. They don't really like to disturb the jury's um, province because the jury is responsible for determining the facts, right? And the facts are witness testimony, the evaluation of experts like doctors, medical records, the trial is, you know, they're not really going to overturn a jury unless it's so egregious, unless the jury is just does something crazy that's not supported by the evidence. That's why the appellate courts are there. They really do read the record so carefully and they spend a lot of time going over the entire trial. But for the most part, they don't disturb a jury. And you see in these cases, they affirmed the 800000 for Miss Henry. They um, affirmed the uh, 550000 for Mr. Destino. That was the case with the uh, trooper uh, against the state of New York in the fourth department. And then the 600000 was Gunteric. That was against the New York City Transit Authority, the, the trip and fall on the subway tile. And they also affirmed the jury's um, a verdict for $600,000. And then in the final case, the 225000 for Mr. Joe was likewise affirmed. And that was the court of claims decision. And then um, the court said that that was proper. So all of these, um, all of these decisions are, are interesting. And I think this entire vlog is very interesting because what he's doing is he's, you know, summarizing the case law and he's telling you what New York courts have done recently. These are like the most recent decisions. Some of these are from late 2021 and the rest are from 2022 this year. So knowing what the New York courts are doing right now will help you in your case to kind of, you know, guess, should I settle or should I not settle and go to trial and try to get more? So I think this is a really, you know, excellent endeavor on the part of Mr. Hockfelder. And, um, and, you know, and, and there's also like a book I it used to be, I don't know if they still make it, but it used to be called Damages and you could look up any injury and you would have all the case law. I believe it was published by Westlaw Damages book. They would have one each year, really thick book. I can find some and show you guys next time. So I hope this has been helpful. Let us know what you think, but this is what shoulder injuries are going for in New York in 2022 and 2021. Okay, everybody, talk to you soon and look forward to answering your questions, helping you and speaking to you very soon. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.